Talking Voiceovers with me, Gail Goslin, interviewing professionals of the South African industry to inspire each other and all newcomers. Our guest today is Ashley Dowds, television presenter, podcaster, actor, and of course, voiceover artist. We'll be chatting about the local VO landscape, storytelling with podcasts, as well as Saga, the South African Guild of Actors. So don't go anywhere. Let's get started. Hi, Ashley. Welcome. Yay. Thank you. Cool. It's nice to have you. <laughs> Good to be here. You started out as a theater actor. How did you progress into the field of voiceovers? You know, the funny thing is, I think I think all of these things were um, part of the, the beginnings of being an actor, really, was trying to get by with a stream of income, So, um, which is necessary. You know, you need to to be able to find them. It's elusive, but you have to keep searching. Uh, so when I started, when I started working, I was actually a teacher and I, I knew that I wanted to be an actor. That was the plan. I just started teaching because I had a, I, I had a grant to, to go and study teaching for a while. And that was after my, my, um, university degree. So when I finally ventured out on my own as a freelancer, um, one of the first recordings I did was on one of those little tape decks, those little tape recorder cassette decks and the science teacher at the school recorded <laughs> he recorded a show reel for me so all i did was i i grabbed some adverts in a magazine and uh and i read some of the copy from the the magazine and i strung together a, a show reel and i'd sort of deliver the the cassettes to different studios so that was part of going out there and, and starting to act and i was in durban so uh, most of the acting, pretty much all of the acting was on stage, really. So I was I was in theatre as I started, and I was I was lucky to walk straight out of teaching into a job, but then nothing, and then there was another job, and then nothing, and eventually I decided I'd need to go up to Joburg to find more consistent work, and so I moved to Joburg after about four years in Durban. And um, got involved in television and film. And um, and then the whole landscape changed in Joburg. So partly because of that, I moved to Cape Town. So that's where I am now. What do you mean the whole landscape changed in Joburg? The commercial work that I was mostly involved with has thinned out to a degree um, because I used to do quite a lot of branded voices. So I was doing a lot a lot of work for banks and, and cars and 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 big brand products and so i i thought that what i'd move into is something that's more related to um below the below the line marketing or even e-learning so getting back in touch with being a teacher and back in touch with being a storyteller i could um get more involved with that and so it didn't really matter where i was whether I'm in Joburg or Cape Town, it doesn't really affect the studio work. And now, I mean, the landscape has changed to another extent, that, you know, that we've had to press that reset button on on where we are and how we work because of COVID. So you don't need to be in a, a studio anymore. So you build your own, you know, you build your own unit as, as most voice artists have, have been doing. I'm actually finding a lot of people asking those questions, even people that aren't voiceovers, you know, an author, phone the other day for some advice about how to connect to the BBC, for example. And a, a producer, a documentary producer from the UK, wanted to know how he would start his own podcasts and record from home. So a lot of people are, are in on it. Let's go back quickly to the difference between Joburg and Cape Town. Was there a difference um, in the kind of work that you can find in Cape Town and in Joburg? But let's say before the pandemic. Well, to be honest, I got to Cape Town and I started doing a little bit more commercial work um, in studios. So no, it wasn't quite true. But then I, I contacted clients to, to get more work in e-learning. So actually it wasn't just, you know, having moved to Cape Town that the landscape changed. It was because I was making some kind of an effort and I'm not making enough of an effort, but I was making some effort to actually get into a new platform. And that's what helped. I mean, you know, like I say, part of the reason I moved to Cape Town was because of the landscape in voiceover and, and in the, the work that I was doing, because the story was shifting, the story was changing demographically and, and also for television, you know, I've, I've got to say that too, that this, the storylines um, changed there. So I, I don't have as much storyline 
although that's always changing it's always dynamic so so i have to come back to that that idea of moving because it's a partial reason i'm i move too because i i really enjoy being outdoors and i enjoy climbing and i enjoy you know i enjoy being close to a forest and being close to a beach pretty much as basic yeah. as that yeah if you're enjoying this interview give it a thumbs up do you think it's possible to make a full-time living as a voice actor in South Africa? Or, or do you need to be doing other things like stage acting, presenting, businesses? What is your opinion on that? Mm. I, it's very hard. I find it very hard to just make a living with uh, voice work. I teach a little and, uh, you know, and I was going to say I act, but now acting is, is, is um, very restricted because of COVID. Um, Theatres are not operating because we can we can only have 100 people inside and producers just don't want to that, that it again it doesn't scale so i think if you're going to if you're going to set out to be a voice artist you have to do all the the uh, the work on your voice and you have to obviously do work in finding those audiences which is constant i value what you've said before gail about um you know being on it constantly checking and not being too in your face with your clients but but just being there and, and allowing them to see um, to hear from you and to to acknowledge that you have something to offer but it is hard I mean, and then i think of late there's a lot of people wanting to clamber on this this wagon because it seems to be the easiest thing to do especially for actors who are not working at the moment they um they feel if they just buy a microphone everything will be well but as you know it's it's so layered there's so many things you have to juggle to actually to get that economy ecosystem going for yourself but being an actor do you think that helps and to be a good voiceover yeah i think so i mean i i think the benefits rather than saying exclusively that actors are the best voice artists i think that it has benefits i think the imagination is is quite useful and i'm constantly working with that i mean i often record something on my own here and I haven't got to that point I haven't used my imagination I haven't you know really been present when I'm recording and I listen to it all and I think oh, it's so flat it's so unlistenable I just yeah, you know, consistency it's you have to keep working at it tell us about your home setup your studio I've bounced around from house to house so after moving from a fairly permanent position in Joburg, where I had a studio, like you, I, I built a studio from the, with the same company, actually. They came in and kitted me out, and it was really useful to have that because the, you could have everything set up and close the door, and there's your studio. When I moved, I moved to, this is the third place I've been in, in Cape Town. The first place was an apartment above this old German lady who used to play the, the radio quite loud, and it was terrible. So I bought myself... So yeah, let me just reach over. I'm going to be rude and reach over here. I'll show you what I've I bought myself this kind of thing. PF8 Ultron. Yeah, so the mic, yeah, so it kind of fits in your mic. And, and that helped to a certain extent in that environment. It cuts some of the noise out. And I could do it in my bedroom. So I found a little corner of the bedroom. And I, I took a couple of these, these acoustic panels here yeah, that were made by, was it True Sound? True Sound Acoustics. Yeah. True Sound did my studio, yeah. Yeah, I always carry those with me wherever I move, and I've put that up in a basement now. Well, the sound luckily, luckily sounds enough, amazing this. from here. <laughs> yeah, well, it's not bad, you know. I mean, in the basement, you've got these foundational walls, and they're really thick, you know. They're really big walls, so they cut quite a lot of the noise. But um, as I say, there's a there's an old Labrador next door who I heard comes, him, yeah. his voice <laughs> comes right through here. And I've, I've got work to do. I'm going to seal off this one section. You can see there's a kind of, see where that blanket's hanging there? Mm -hmm. So I'm still putting my head towards closing this whole section off. Making with, it sound um, proof. Yeah, you get a particular cause... rhino board, uh, an acoustic panel in rhino board. And then I bought some, I was on Facebook and I bought some uh, rock wool. I've got a whole pile of rock wool here that needs to go in, t in between the, the rhino board and another board. And I can put that up over there. Oh, there so we you go. Can you can see your microphone. Yeah. Tell us what's what microphone is that? That is an AKG 214. So I found a lot, there were a few studios in, in Joburg that used to use the, the big brother to that, which is the um, 414, I think. The 414 has a, it's live on both sides. I don't know how to describe that. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah so you're going to have two speakers. This one only, it's, it's live on the one side. There's that cardio, cardioid pattern in the front. 
but it's really nice. You know, I really like it. I have another one, which is the, so yeah, you, you, you conjuring the geek, aren't you, Gail? Yeah. I'm getting my geek out. <laughs> Good. <laughs> so I've also got, this is the stock standard that a lot of people use. And it's, you know, it's quite reasonable actually it's for what it is. It's the same one I've got here. You pay. That one. Yeah. I mean, it's the, um, it's the road. Yeah. Now it's all falling apart because I've picked it up. But <laughs> but you know the one I'm talking about. Yeah, it's very popular. It's, um, what I find about this mic, it's got a lot more clarity than the other mic. That mic that I use is very warm. Um, okay, so, and you've got uh, a warm voice as well. Yeah, you know, I've never really gone into choosing the right mic for my voice, actually. And it's difficult a, because whole... in the shops here, you can't really test it out. They say you that's can right. in, in the and States, I... but here... Are... I've yeah. already found that you can. So. I, that bugs me a little bit. Oh. I wish you could, actually. In the States, you're right. That's the, that's the thing to do. You go into the shop and you can line up six mics and say, okay, plug them in. Let's see what they sound like on my voice. But I guess maybe another thing to do is to, to find out what your frequency is, where your voice sort of fits in, and then find the mic that fits those frequencies. Because you can actually, someone as clever as Andrew would be able to make those kind of choices for you. Yeah, go into the studio, do a bit of recording, and then advise you on the kind of mic yeah. you should be getting. And then I got, so the mic I'm talking to you on now is a, it's a kind of directional mic. Okay, also Rode. So, so it's a Rode. It's an, oh, yeah. It's an NTG. And they use this for, um, for film. I got it because I wanted to make podcasts. It was a decision between getting the, um, you know, the kind of podcasty mic that you get that cuts noise out quite effectively. A lot of the news journalists use it. So if you shove a mic into uh, an interviewee's face, all the background noise and everything is cut quite severely. And it's quite clean. So it's, it's very useful. This doesn't do as much as that. But you'll notice when you've got your cans on and you're moving this mic around, it, it does pinpoint where the sound is. And if you move away from the source, the sound goes. So We got a bit um, of an effect I, there when you moved it around. Could, could hear the, your, your voice changing move yeah so yeah. so yeah. here's my yeah. voice over here and then coming so it's not quite i don't think it's quite cardioid but it's very directional yeah. yeah and i wanted to use it for getting foley as well oh yeah you do that as well you do foley yeah well like i say you know when you when you want to make a decent story you want to have, you want to have the equivalent of a wide shot a close-up a medium shot so i'll be walking through the forest and and i don't do this enough Actually, because I find a lot of the edits that I've made, I'm short. I haven't done a buzz track or I haven't got that effect, that ambience that I was hoping for. And just because I'd forgotten, I, sh I should have planned it. But but there are moments where I've actually thought about it and I'm, I'm walking through the forest and you can hear the leaves under my feet. Those crisp kind of autumny leaves. And you want that feeling of taking the, the listener through that, that forest on that journey. Mm. So you record that and, and then there's some bird noises. And then I, I love... The different kinds of frogs so whenever i'm walking I, I, even if i've got my cell phone I, i'm recording tree frogs and oh uh, lovely but you can get you can get sounds like that if you're using adobe audition by any chance there's a whole library full of um, of foley sounds that you can use in case you missed yeah, them yeah i'm yeah thanks for telling me that actually thanks I have to ask you about Saga because that is relevant for voice artists and you're quite involved in that. Can you tell us a little bit about that, about Saga and what it's for? Saga is there as a guild for performing artists and we're, we're included as voice artists because audiovisual material is obviously commercial and the interests of the performer in terms of getting, say, residuals or, or just getting payment per se or signing contracts or having agreements with other producers, they all fall under this the kind of legislation that we're faced with. And um, one of the things that really struck me when I first joined Saga was the fact that our legislation in this country is so, so old. It was drafted pre-television days, and we are suffering the consequences of that old legislation. Now we're catching up, and we've hit the road not quite running because these giants, these media giants, have just gobbled up a lot of content and a lot of production globally. So, you know, the way it affects us is within the contract. So copyright material and performers' rights are affected. 
for a start. And if we're not alert to what the changes are, we're going to be left behind, as many countries are, in the wake of these big giants, because they don't want contracts that are going to affect their bottom line. But we have to defend, you know, we have to defend our rights. And that's why I joined Saga. It's because we need to collect more and more of a voice to... Um, to speak about this. But just to, for people that don't know, the, that old legislation went through a huge process of discussion and putting it out to public. And um, they created what they called the amendment to the Performers Protection Bill and the Copyright Bill. And it was all cleared through Parliament, the various departments that it goes through, the Portfolio Committee, et cetera, et cetera. And it landed on the president's desk. And then the president was hit with all these huge questions from various lawyers and it essentially came down to the legislation about copyright and fair use a lot of it's to do with with fair use and our sense of fair use is very different to what what the, the corporate giants see as fair use and they feel like things need to go back into parliament again so just as we thought the president was going to sign and we were going to have legislation that was in our favor in this country and we could maybe look at getting residual payments and royalties when products are being sold off to syndicates and to other places around the world that all came to a grinding halt um that's a long answer but but sagas that's one of the things that sagas involved with is that huge question of legislation because unless it's in law we don't really have a leg to stand on part of the stopgap that that sagas come up with is this idea of and it was invited by the department of employment and labor and they've suggested that um we could come to an agreement even before legislation kicks in, we can agree as an industry as a whole on the kind of working conditions that are favorable to performers. And that's what Saga's also been um, inputting in. The problem is that we just don't have one voice. You know, people either prefer to be ignorant, they prefer to just stay on the sidelines and not get involved, or they, they're not interested in joining this kind of agreement because it's not in their interests. So I'm talking about all the other factors that come into it, the, the producers associations and, and various others, they are all part of this whole ecosystem. And there has to be an agreement so that the Department of Employment and Labor can say, well, favorable conditions mean one, two, three. Let's all, let's gazette that. And then we can have that in the contract. So Saga is a bit like a union for actors in South Africa. Yeah, we can't use the word union because a union is for employer, employees. Ah. So it's, it's, um, it's for labor disputes between employer, employee. We're independent contractors, so we operate as freelancers. We don't have employers, but the again, the nature of that business and the term that's used is being looked at by the Department of Labor. Whereas in the States, SAG-AFTRA is a union and actors are still freelancers. Yeah, be so we just because, the status of the, because the status of the performer is different in the States. I see. But what we do have, what Saga has, is a very strong relationship with UASA, which is the umbrella body for the unions. And they've agreed to take on Saga and to look after Saga under their umbrella. So when you get your guild card as a Saga member, it'll say UASA. And they deal with all the, the subscription payments and everything else. We're very lucky to have them as a, as a recourse to legal action too. So if anything big happens, the union legal people can step in. So like phenomenal. with the pandemic? How did Saga and Yuasa help actors during the pandemic? You mean financially? In any way, w was there any help that Saga and Yuasa could give to actors at all during the pandemic when everyone was out of work? Well, the, the thing is, when you're talking about COVID relief funds and oh. the PESP funding that was offered by the Department of Arts, um, Sport and Culture, that was, in a sense, the relief that should have come for COVID, but it became problematic. And I think so the pushback from Saga's perspective or anyone else's, any other performer, was in trying to counter the way it was handled because it wasn't very well handled up front. In fact, there were funds that went missing. So Saga and the union can't really control, can't really provide funding or finances. No, 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 but, work, but provide assistance, maybe or guidance, or is that something they can do? Sure. Well, as, as far as guidance goes, Saga is providing a lot of practical guidance through their webinars. And if you, if you see them on, on Facebook, you'll see there's everything from submitting your tax as an independent contractor, as a 3616 contractor, which is what we should all have in our contracts. We're not employers, uh, uh, employees, so we don't fall into that tax code. We, we, you know, that's an understanding that we're all going to have. So it's from tax to your sense of well-being and the way that, and there's one coming up this Saturday on well-being and mental health 
because I think a lot of people have really struggled through COVID. That's been taken care of through these webinars or coaching. Like, you know, you, we've we've been doing the, the voiceover webinars for with Saga as well. And there's one coming up on the 17th of July. So now you work from home, you do e-learning and you do audiobook narrations in your own studio. Yeah, the, the audiobook narrations is a little bit of a sore point really um i've never got that right i've done a couple i've marketed that acx which which you probably know is the big one for amazon it's the amazon um, audiobook arm really. yeah um, they don't really serve us as voice artists as south african voice artists unfortunately um, yeah so yeah. you have to go scale them and you have to set up an address and a bank account somewhere else which some people have done i haven't so that's a bit of an issue and you know people keep saying when you approach them about books or they approach you that the market here for audiobooks is too small it's too slim to actually find a decent enough budget and you speak to people like andrew as well from big mouth who will say that the the margins are so tight that the um the money to do a, a full book and sometimes it can take you a couple of months to to finish it is not that great so i find a lot of people want to stay with commercial recording because that's where the money is you know because otherwise there are other platforms besides acx um there's one in south africa that i know of and there's several around the world so you don't have to only record for south africa you can be recording for anywhere around the world if you have the right voice yeah, no sure and right. Also, again, I, I'm speaking from from ignorance as well. So I, you possibly know a lot more about those other audiobook platforms. Certainly, there are, and there's there's a couple of a couple of apps that have started as well. Also, just trying to find their feet, much like the podcasters are trying to find their feet financially, find out how it scales. Because even a big podcast, like, and I know it's different platform, but in terms of engaging some sort of economy around it even the platform that daily maverick is using they've got a, a podcast called don't shoot the messenger produced by and narrated by a journalist and they've struggled so even a big organization like daily maverick is is battling to to find the means to actually produce these things because um, the audience just here isn't big enough yeah and i think it's just you know I, I suppose there's a whole lot of factors it's how to market that how to find the audience how to develop the audience you know we're all still learning I think we're still a bit behind. They say we, we're kind of five or 10 years behind what America's doing. Because if you listen to the big podcasts from NPR, like This American Life and Audio Lab, they've been going for a long time and they've got a consistency and they've got a huge following. So yeah, it's, I think we, we're still learning. We're still cutting a path for ourselves. Their population is bigger as well, bigger oh, than South Africa. man, Africa's. you can't even compare it. Yeah, yeah. that's the thing, <laughs> hey. I mean, we're, we're looking at a population of... 55 million but that's not listeners or readers i've, I've seen people whittle it down to like a, maybe a hundred thousand people in the whole country that'll listen to audiobooks and then you know i'm just thumb sucking but that's that's yeah. the kind of memory that i have of it but and and then the people that listen to yours you might have six people and, so, and that's just not enough <laughs> it's not enough to actually to to stimulate your production so why did you start a podcast and what is it all about because i just love audio i love I love story um, because I come from this background of being on stage and telling stories and, and being in, in television. Radio too has been quite special. I start, I, when I started, I was starting in radio in Durban. So a lot of the, um, the work I did was audio. Peter Dirk A says, you know, that, that radio has the best pictures because it's all in that, that imagination. And imagination, memory, storytelling, they're all part of the same sort of neuro chemistry in the brain so you you're using your imagination a lot more than you are when you're watching a video and i have to say too i was just thinking about it this morning I, the more you tune into youtube and you watch video the more you're overwhelmed with other content that just intrudes on your experience so to make a podcast in the true sense of what the podcast actually stands for in in its own platform it's a unique experience you're curating audio for the listener for the ear you're not just and i i think a lot of radio stations are wrong in um, using the title podcast after a chit chat with someone on on the radio station they'll the engineer will clip together something and call it a podcast but it's it's not really curated for that platform it's just a chunk of audio that came from a conversation from from a radio station but kind you know of what like I'm, what we're doing here <laughs> as well <laughs> well no i think no no i think what you're doing is you're curating you've created a podcast series based on a theme and you're there editing and creating this this unique platform and i think that has you know you have the right to stand on that that, that label it's an experience that you're not going to have by watching you're going to have when you close your eyes and you 
plug in your headphones and someone has lovingly curated all this amazing audio and sound to take you on this journey. So there we go. And that is what you do in your podcast as well. You tell all these different stories about people. Yes. And I'm working on a series now called Landmark, which is about land, culture and belonging. So again, it's about identity and it's about where do we, what affects our sense of belonging and who we are. I start with something in Cape Town that's, that's primary. It's the beginnings of what Cape Town was before anything ever happened here in terms of trade or, you know, European presence. There was this stream that comes down from the middle of the mountain. It's the mountain's doorway, Table Mountain's doorway. It's called Plutterclip. And if you stand at one angle, you can see there's kind of an opening in the mountain. There's a doorway. Down in the middle there somewhere, there's a big stream that, that runs down. It filters down through the mountain it, and it comes up in, I don't know how many springs and outlets that used to be sprinkled around the city as well. But now it goes underground and goes under the city. So it's almost like a metaphor for, for, for everything that, that used to be part of that presence in those days. It's just disappeared. It's still running. You can hear it. If you stop in a street sometimes, you go, wow, it wasn't raining, but I can hear all that flowing down there. It's quite exciting because that history that we read about, the, the first encounters with the Khoi tribes that European ships and shipwrecked sailors would encounter, they were basically speaking to people around this stream. And the reason why ships were stopping, obligatory stops, uh, were made here because of that water. And it's still coming past the city. I'm, I begin there, but a lot of it is is um, trying to collect sound as well. So it's not just me. It's not me narrating. In fact, I'm trying to get around how to stop that, how to, how to stop narrating too much. You like you uh, love to I tell think, stories, so. <laughs> yes, I do. And I think there's I think there's a place for it. Definitely a place. But in this particular context, in the context of having yeah. a platform yeah. for audio stories. I think it's really useful for in the show and tell you want to, you want to show and not tell too much. They, the, the advice that, that writers are often given is visually you, you, you would um, have a close up on a hand and the hand is shaking. So you understand some of the story because you can see the, there's, there's a, a wobbly hand and, and it, te it tells the story of who that person is. So you don't want to overstate it. And the same thing happens with, with audio stories. You want to, you want to get that close up shot, even though it's not a visual, there's a, there's something that's the equivalent in, in audio. So the sound of the stream so, under the street, for example. Yeah. But then obviously sometimes you do need to step in and say, okay, what you're hearing now is part of the platyclip stream. And I'd stopped here on a certain day. And I heard this incredible voice coming up from the river and it just put me in a, this place of magic and I couldn't walk any further. And I didn't have a microphone with me. So I had my cell phone, which is what I do sometimes. Cell phone mics are quite good. Actually, they've got this radius. It's like, it's a wide shot. So you've got this wide angle shot from your, your cell phone microphone. And, and on this particular day, so I'm telling you a real story. I'm going along the stream and I hear this absolutely gorgeous female vocal noise, not noise, vocal magic coming from, from the river. And I, I stopped and I didn't want to intrude on, on what was going on, but I, I sensed that there's a person, I, I got a sight of this woman in, in Tosa regalia. She had this traditional Tosa outfit on and she was in the stream and she was doing a ritual. So I thought maybe it's a bit disrespectful to, to record it, but I just have to have this. And I, I stood quietly and closed my eyes in respect for this moment and recorded the sound. I took it to a friend of mine who happens to be quite an expert because he's a Sangoma himself. And he said to me, that is a pretty well-known song. It comes from a very deep-rooted tradition. It's called a Mundao song, and it's it's um, the the conjuring of a water spirit. So I mean, that said it all for me. You know, if I was going to find a place where the source, where the, the, there is a source, and it's a source not just physically and geographically, and not just a place where Cape Town started, it's a source for our spirituality. That was it. So I found it, I just stumbled upon it. I didn't know it. And then the moments like that, that we kind of walk past, we're not really listening properly. Most of the time we spend our lives just like zombies. I do. <laughs> you don't obviously. 
Well, no, I'm, I, you know, I'm trying consciously. I think there's a lot to say about meditation too, and, and being in a kind of state of awareness when you, especially when you're trying to create a story, I guess. And you would be in a state like that when you're acting on stage, perhaps. Very like true. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I think, and, and meditation would, would not be quite the right word to use because you don't want to be in a state that puts you in completely in yourself. Meditation in the sense that you're aware, uh, that you're mindful of all of these signals and these impulses that are moving around you so that you can respond, that you are alive to them. And that's the reality. That's the sense of the sense of reality that you can bring to a story on stage as well. It's just being very true to a moment and responding to it as if it's just happened to you. Although you've been doing it for 120 performances, you know, it's happening now. Where can people reach you if they want to ask you questions or find out about you? Probably the, the best way is story to voice with a number two in between at gmail.com. Story to voice at gmail.com. Is there anything you want to add for newcomers? One piece of advice, how to get started? The, the advice that, that is most often given to people is that you have to just keep reading and practicing. And I think if you put yourself into a different context and you use that sense of imagination, use your imagination for each context. So pick three, pick a, an audio book, take a chapter, give yourself the challenge of reading a chapter, for example, and really understand what the quality of those voices are for the character and what their motivations are. And then always try and talk to someone on the other side of the microphone. That's that's one of the biggest things, I think, is, you know, you're actually speaking to another person. This sound is going to another ear somewhere. And it's not just you in front of a microphone. Good point. You, whatever you're doing, you're telling a story. Thanks for chatting with us. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Cheers. Cheers, we'll Gail. Ciao. Ciao, ciao. Thank you for watching Talking VoiceOvers. If you don't want to miss any of the following interviews, be sure to subscribe and hit that bell button. <laughs>